Welcome back, AP. All right, welcome back to your last flip for this unit. Right now, we set our test date. We know we're going to be taking our test in the end of the revolution, the Napoleonic period, uh, actually going into the end of the next week, right? So, and like I said, we're taking some stuff from this unit in the AP curriculum. We're pushing it on to the next one and things like that so we can capitalize on some time and things of that sort. And also, because this back end of the revolution is very dense. You've got the rise of the Committee of Public Safety. You've got the reign of terror. You've got the end of the liberal phase. You've got the storming of the Tuileries, the flight of Varenne. You've got the Napoleonic period. Ah! And like all this other stuff. But like I said, we're going to start reviewing all that in class, and we're going to have a day to review it one morning before the test. Like, y'all are going to get your exclusive time. It's going to be awesome, right? But I don't want to necessarily waste your time with a super long flip because we only have a little bit more to talk about. We have to talk about the French First Empire, and we have to talk about Napoleon's fall, right? So now the big thing about it, though, going into this whole understanding is also down below in the description, I'm going to drop a couple of videos, and if you want to watch them to try and help yourself understand a couple of things a little bit better, and maybe listen to these videos that might have some facts in them that I didn't bring up be feel welcome and free to do that right sam shout out to you i know that these will really help you a lot um like definitely big ones are like the john green videos and then also there's a really good one on uh from the biographies channel that actually is all about napoleon now so going into it though after an assassination attempt uh, napoleon is going to declare himself the emperor of france in january of 1804 right now the big thing about this is you have to understand just like those paintings that we looked at that showed napoleon crossing down one on the back of his stoic horse named Marengo, where he rode him across the fields of northern Italy. Blah. Like, so, like, all that stuff. So we know that a lot of people supported Napoleon in France, mainly because he's creating a Napoleonic code that's enforcing the ideas of the French Revolution for guys, right? So we know that a lot of people support him because he's trying to stabilize things. He's trying to create a meritocracy, lyces, things of that nature and that sort, right? That he brings the Catholic Church back, that he actually meets with Pope Pius VII is the number of that, that Pope. Um, like, meets with him, like, gets rid of the cult, the cult of the Supreme Being. Like, gets rid of that entire thing. <laughs> I'm sorry, it just sounds like this. And like I said, you know, go to in your McKenna, whenever y'all have your first death metal show, let me know. I'll be your biggest supporter. Now, the biggest thing about it, though, is after an assassination attempt on Napoleon's life in January of 1804, he decides that he is going to create himself as the emperor of France, declare himself much more like stoic in charge and also on board with everything else that he's trying to do. So and a lot of it is like he's growing a lot of like sentiment as well against Britain even more, because apparently in this assassination attempt, there was a secret British agent that was aiding these people that were trying to assassinate him to reinstall the Bourbons and go back to a true monarchy. So he's like, you want a monarchy? Fine. How about now you have an emperor? And he literally crowns himself emperor in this ceremony, okay? Looking at this picture right here is by Jacques-Louis David. It's another one of my favorite paintings ever. I'm just saying, like, David is one of my favorite artists. I think he's phenomenal. The realism, the sentiment, the intensity, the play of light as well, which is so cool. But if you actually see this entire thing, what ended up happening is Napoleon entered in a Romophile in and of himself because he was, like, very, very into the history of the ancient Romans and the ancient Greeks. He entered in to Notre Dame to be crowned the emperor of France. And guess who he invited him? Yep, that's right, the Pope, who's sitting right there. Pope Pius VII, who is seated, was there to bless the crown that would be put upon his head and then actually lower it down onto his head. But what ended up happening, uh, Napoleon entered in not wearing a crown, but already wearing a leaf of a wreath of laurel, right? And a laurel wreath is like the one that I have in class, right? My laurel wreath, the one that's the gold, like laurel wreath that go around his head. He entered into Notre Dame wearing this laurel wreath on his head already. And he snatched the crown out of the Pope's hands, turns, blesses it, and then puts a crown on top of his wife, Josephine, right? And crowns her Empress of France. Now, there's a lot of really, really interesting stuff that does end up going down. Later on in life, he does divorce Josephine, actually, due to the fact that Josephine could not provide him with any children. And he also ends up getting one of Josephine's children from an earlier marriage married off to his brother. Like so, and like all this other stuff. And he also believed, like, again, he treated Josephine a lot like he treated many other women. Apparently, there was a woman that actually showed up to talk to Napoleon and interview him. And he was like, oh, I only think women are good for one thing. And then stared at her chest the entire time, which is really really disgusting, right? Because we know his views of women are not very appropriate. Even though he is crowning his wife, the emperor of France, he is like trying to demonstrate his power over everyone else, just like he demonstrated his power over the Pope saying, no church will crown me, I will crown me, right? 
It's a very intense moment in history. And then he started having portraits like this of himself made, demonstrating the emperors and the emperor-like qualities that he wanted to project onto France. He's getting very arrogant at this point, right, as we can see. Now, the big thing, though, after that, after January of 1804, he starts assembling as much money and military as he possibly can to go off and fight these things known as the Napoleonic Wars, right? Now, the Napoleonic Wars are just a series of wars that happened underneath his reign when it was considered the French First Empire, right? Or, sorry, excuse me, the First French Empire or the French First Empire. It doesn't really matter either way. Now, remember our pattern, though. We got French First Republic, French First Empire, French Second Republic, French Second Empire, blah, 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 blah. So we know some more empires from France are on the way a little bit later on. Ironically enough, underneath his nephew, Napoleon III. Now, look, really, really quickly, though, looking at this whole thing. The Napoleonic Wars are a cataclysmic event throughout European history. Because from 1803 to 1812, for a series of about nine years, Napoleon sets out to try and conquest and destroy coalition forces that threatened his empire. Now, these are going to take place from the wars of the Third to the Sixth Coalition, okay? So France has won the war of the First and Second Coalition and has claimed land in northern Italy under Napoleon, has claimed land out towards the Netherlands and what was modern-day Belgium today and Luxembourg, has claimed these lands over other people, which is why he believes he can call his place the French First Empire, okay? Now, what ends up occurring, though, is the coalition start forming again of Prussia, forces from the Holy Roman Empire, Austria, Russia, and many of the other like also the British as well, they start forming these coalitions and they start saying like, you know what, we're going to go and attack. And so Napoleon practices what you could consider defensive warfare, right? Where he protects his own borders and then when he sees a time to strike, when he sees a weakness, he goes out and attacks in full force. And when that side loses major military engagements, he would then take from them large parcels of land, right? So what ends up happening from 1803 to 1812 I'm not kidding, Napoleon takes over everything outlined in red. Like, good lord. Like, he takes over what, what used to be the Holy Roman Empire. He takes over all of Italy, Corsica, all of the Empire of Austria, all of Prussia, all of Denmark, all of Spain, not of Portugal, and then also all not of the United Kingdom, aka the British, right? And a lot of the entire Napoleonic warfare strategies and things like that can really be cooked down into two major battles. Now, all day long, we could talk about a lot of the different battles during the Napoleonic Wars and the Wars of the Coalitions. We could talk about Marengo. We could talk about the crossing of the Alps. We could talk about a lot of different engagements that occurred throughout these 12 years or nine years of time. But in 1805, two of the biggest battles that occurred went down within about six to seven months of each other, right? Now, the first one that happened was known as the Battle of Trafalgar. Now, looking at this battle right here and looking at this scene, Trafalgar was a naval engagement. So if it's a naval engagement, we know that it's probably going to be between the French and the British, right? So the French under Napoleon spent a long time assembling a massive navy and decided that they wanted to try and do what no one's supposed to try and do and try to go out there and directly attack and invade the British on their own soil. What happened the last time that was? Oh, that was this thing called the Spanish Armada under Philip II against Elizabeth I. That was a big fat failure, right? This is also going to be a big fat failure. The Napoleonic Navy is crushed by the British Navy. And of course, who is commanding the British Navy during this entire engagement? None other than Admiral Horatio Nelson literally destroying the French Navy, having a scar on his face, missing an eye or the use of an eye, and having one arm. But on top of that, though, Admiral Nelson does die in this battle. But the plan was to like show up with these massive numbers of these French ships of the line and go up against the larger HMS fleet of Her Majesty's Royal Service, right, of the British. And it ended up being a chaotic engagement that resulted in the sinking of almost the entire French Navy and the winning of the British Navy. There is currently in the United Kingdom, in London, a place called Trafalgar Square, right, that commemorates the British victory of this battle. So after this, after this engagement, Napoleon basically loses his entire navy and realizes that he must retain what little navy he has to try and actually regulate trade and things like that. So he kind of sleeks his way back home after losing the Battle of Trafalgar. And also one thing that happened here that he did enjoy 
Admiral Nelson died, right? Admiral Nelson died at the Battle of Trafalgar because he, like, wasted all of his nine lives after getting shot in the face and everything else, and this time he got shot in the back. And we'll talk about it a little bit in class as well, but he ended up paralyzed and literally dying after about three hours of misery and pain. But he was directing the battle literally when he lost the use of his legs up until the point of his death. Now, looking at this entire thing, though, Trafalgar is a major turning point. But then you have the Battle of Austerlitz, right? The Battle of Austerlitz came after Napoleon swept through the Holy Roman Empire, completely destroyed that entire area, which, well, he does that in 1806. But at the Battle of Austerlitz, Napoleon came up against coalition forces, including the Prussians, the Russians, and the Austrians, and successfully beat them using flanking maneuvers, artillery engagements, and large charges to the middles of their line, right? And big thing that happens, as you can see right here, this right here are the Prussian forces coming to surrender to Napoleon's forces at the Battle of Austerlitz. The Battle of Austerlitz was kind of a massive proof that Napoleon's armies were almost undefeatable on land. No one could defeat a Napoleonic military on land due to the tactics that Napoleon, that Napoleon was using. Literally, Napoleonic military tactics are still taught at all of the military academies in the United States of America because of its flanking maneuvers and actually its movements like throughout battlefields. So, and I'll, like I said down below in, uh, like, like below, if you want to learn a little bit more about the Battle of Austerlitz, I don't want to like waste your entire time. And so down like below in the description, there's like a nice little video. So, but at the Battle of Austerlitz, he basically takes over most of the areas of Austria, the areas of what is now modern day Liechtenstein, as well as the area of, uh, what's on the other side of Liechtenstein? It's Austria, Switzerland, and those entire areas as well. Now, major effects of the Napoleonic Wars though, because all the way up until 1812, he's just cruising through the entire continent, taking over anything and everything he can get his hands on. And remember, he is undefeatable on the continent. Now, he does this, of course, without the aid of a navy, but we'll get to that whole thing here in a minute. So the big things that are happening due to the spread of the Napoleonic Wars and the Napoleonic Wars in general is one huge thing is the spread of revolutionary ideas. The ideas that were garnered by the French Revolution of destruction of the nobility, creation of a constitutional monarchy, creations of constitutions in general, voting rights for uh, like all men, like universal suffrage, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, meritocracies and things like that. Revolutionary ideas are spreading to these new kingdoms. So you could almost say that Napoleon literally basically, in an essence, along the way of destroying people and having millions of people killed because over a million people died in the Napoleonic Wars, he had at least, at least the ideas of voting and having democratic systems spread along with him, I guess. So, I mean, like, if we got to look for some silver lining. Hmm. Now, going forward as well, you also have the destruction of the HRE, right? So in 1806, after the Battle of Austerlitz, Napoleon goes in and defeats Francis I of the Holy Roman Empire, an Austrian leader and king of Habsburg descent. He defeats him in battle, and the Holy Roman Empire is completely destroyed. That thing that has been limping along since 1648, after the Thirty Years' War, is finally completely destroyed. And he actually destroys it, and he turns it into this thing that he refers to as the Confederation of the Rhine, right? So, like, now, the Confederation of the Rhine is literally referring to the river, the Rhine River, that actually separates France and Germany, and he refers to it as the Confederation of the Rhine, saying, like, oh, these are just a bunch of German-speaking people in this confederation that used to be the Holy Roman Empire. So he completely destroys the Holy Roman Empire. He also, in this moment, though, when he creates this like whole new confederation of the Rhine and stuff like that, major effect is this entire invasion system leads to a massive Franco-German rivalry, right? The Germans were destroyed by Napoleonic forces and then occupied by Napoleonic troops. So Germans were going about their daily lives having to deal with French-speaking military in their towns and villages and things like that. And so the Germans really kind of got a bad, sour taste in their mouth following the Napoleonic Wars and really believed that the French were like their enemies, right? And so what's going to end up happening later on down the road is you're going to see World War I, World War II, the unification of Germany, there is going to be a major tone of a Franco-German rivalry, right? Stemming all the way back to the Napoleonic Wars. You also have the creation of nation states. Now, this is a really big thing. A major effect of the Napoleonic Wars was the destruction of all these monarchies, right? The monarchs were either allowed to still exist with Napoleon's authority over them, or the monarchies were completely destroyed in some of these principalities and some of these areas of the Confederation of the Rhine. So you had what was moving towards the creation of nation states that would have democratic elections, that would have these different things. Even though, ironically enough, 
Every time Napoleon took someone over, jot this down, every time Napoleon took somebody over, he would usually create a monarchy that was just like a puppet that was loyal to him. And guess who all of them were? This guy who spouts out all this stuff about meritocracy. It's not about who you're related to. It's not about who you're born to. Blah, 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 blah. Every time he would take somewhere over, he would install one of his relatives as their new king. Like the very first like kingdom of the Dutch, when it became like, like remember, the Netherlands has not had a king in a long time, but when Napoleon takes them over, they have a king now again. So ever since the Napoleonic Wars, the, the Dutch have had a king, right? Like, so, which is really, really weird. And they basically do like nothing. Like they're just like a figurehead or like, like kind of just like there. But Napoleon literally installed one of his cousins as the king of the Dutch, right? So like the creation of these nation states ideas are gonna come after Napoleon falls though. Right, so we're seeing the creation of these nation states in general as the like time goes on. But then you also though have like some of you are thinking to yourself, well, well, wait a minute, Mr. Terry. If he did all this stuff and he spread to this great distance and he did all these other things, then why does like the map of Europe look the way that it does? Then what happened that made him recede and France go back to being just its own country? What led to his downfall? Where he had three massive mistakes. One of them is called the Continental System, which was such a stupid idea because he just couldn't leave Britain alone. The other one is known as the Peninsular War, which we'll talk about a lot going forward in like different like artists and stuff like that. Goya is a very, very famous artwork about the Peninsular War. And then also you've got the invasion of Russia, which was the worst idea ever. Like, what were you thinking, right? So like when we're looking at the Napoleonic Wars, you could say that the Napoleonic Wars is this version of Napoleon, right? Stoically standing up in front of everybody, a copy of the Napoleonic Code on his desk, his sword nearby himself, of like whatever this thing was in his hand that I can never remember what it was, standing in full military regalia and literally about to go out and strike at the rest of Europe. But then after his three big mistakes, Napoleon looks like this, right? So this is like a before and after picture of like, look at Napoleon after the Napoleonic Wars and being so like dynamic and great. And then look at this after picture of, this is what he looks like after he tries to invade Russia. So things don't go as well as he would like them to, right? So now getting into it though, you have to understand the continental system first and foremost. When you're talking about his downfall as a dictator, when you're talking about his downfall as the emperor of France, you always start off with the continental system. And I got a couple of little good memes right here. Like for example, you got Napoleon Bonaparte and Alexander I of Russia who violates the continental system and trades with Britain, right? You got the Napoleon continental system and the continental system shoots him in the face, right? So the biggest thing about it is the Continental System was another attempt to try and create a blockade system to choke out British trade from the rest of Europe, right? So here was Napoleon's idea. Use the remaining navy that I have that survived the Battle of Trafalgar and actually use them to create a blockade around Britain and around the continent of Europe and actually prevent anybody that is loyal to us from trading with Britain. Now, some of you are like, well, Mr. Terry, you just said Russia a second ago, but I didn't see them in that big red outline. What about them? Why weren't they in it? So Napoleon would force people in the continent to like trade with him under threat of direct invasion, right? So just keep that in the back of your mind. So he said, Russia, if you do not do what I ask you to, I will invade you, right? So we can see where that's going. So the thing about it was, though, is that many nations are going to ignore it, including Portugal and Russia in particular, right? Portugal and Russia ignore it, and they just keep trading with Britain because the French can't stop them. There's too many holes in it, right? You can bust right through it because they don't have enough boats anymore after the Battle of Trafalgar to stop their naval their naval vessels and trade vessels from going to Britain and just picking up stuff and coming back, right? So Portugal and Russia are its largest violators. So when Portugal violated the continental system, he decides that he wants to go and invade Portugal. And that's what's known as the Peninsular War, right? So from 1807 to 1814, after he's already just like kind of like established the Napoleonic Empire on the continent, like literally he takes over the entire continent of Europe pretty much in like two years. That's absolutely bananas. But he engages in this thing known as the Peninsular War, right? So in the Peninsular War, War, France decides that it wants to go off and attack Portugal for ignoring the continental system. But to get to Portugal, you have to pass through Spain. Now, Napoleon has already taken over Spain in the Napoleonic Wars. And the guy that's actually in charge of the Napoleonic Wars, or excuse me, of the Napoleonic state of Spain or the kingdom of Spain under Napoleonic France is his brother, Joseph, right? So Joseph is the king of Spain. 
And the Spanish press inviscerated this guy all the time. They were like, he's a drunk, he's awful, he's French, no one likes him. So there was this like guerrilla marketing going on underneath the like entire thing of Joseph, right? Joseph had no ability to control the Spanish people. They did what they wanted to. They didn't follow Napoleonic rules and they kept doing anything and everything. And when they saw the French army coming through Spain to get to Portugal for violating the continental system, the Spanish men decide to form militias and they use guerrilla warfare tactics to actually attack the French military on their way through. They destroy their trade routes. They get after them. They literally launch guerrilla raids on French locations for over six years. And Napoleonic tactics cannot beat guerrilla warfare, right? Napoleonic tactics are not built to beat guerrilla warfare. Napoleonic tactics are, let's face each other, let's aim, let's use flanking maneuvers, heavy charges, cavalry in certain areas, and artillery. All of that is meant to be fought in an open field or maybe on elevated ridges. Not in the woods where the people that are jumping out at you know where to run and hide, right? So like the Spanish inflict massive casualties onto the French because Napoleon cannot figure out a way to stop all of these raids, right? So during the Peninsular Campaign as well, you also saw massive executions of firing squads against some of these Spanish men. This right here, for example, is the painting called May 8th or the Night of May 8th by Francisco Goya, having a Napoleonic troops lining up French or Spanish guerrillas one at a time and having all of them shot, right? So this really, really, really is a climactic, very terrible time period for Napoleon and his control of Spain because his brother has no ability to hold on to this area, right? So that's the Peninsular Campaign or the Peninsular War. Now on top of everything else though, you've got the invasion of Russia in 1812. This right here is Napoleon's biggest screw up, his massive screw up, his you don't do it if you're a dictator in Europe kind of marker for the rest of history. Just listen to me when I tell you, if any of you become dictators of Europe, Katie for tweet, I'm looking at you, do not invade Russia, no matter what time of year it is, right? So Napoleon decides that he's going to invade Russia because the king of Russia, Alexander I, has ignored the continental system and has traded with Britain anyway, right? So like they've been trading with Britain for a lot of textile manufactured goods, a lot of other different items that they have coming out of these new factories that exist in Great Britain. Mm. And he uh, decides to trade with them regardless, right? So Napoleon decides, okay, I know that you're not supposed to invade Russia. But if Poland can do it, I can do it. And so Napoleon comes up with an idea. He's like, I'm going to assemble the biggest army that literally Europe has ever seen. I'm going to assemble an army of 600,000 troops known as the Grand Army. And the Grand Army pulled people from Prussia, Austria. The bulk of them were French, but like the, like also from everywhere else they had taken over. Italian troops, Spanish troops, like all over the Napoleonic Empire and creates the Grand Army, right? And the Grand Army, with Napoleon at the head of it, goes off to Russia. Napoleon literally was there in Russia when this happens. But here's the thing the Russians are going to do, who were severely undermanned and severely underprepared, right? The Russians, ironically enough, had less troops in their army at this point, did not have as many guns, and were not as prepared to actually fight supplies-wise. But the Russians are smart, right? Because the Russians adopt this concept called scorched earth policy. And literally, they would engage Napoleon's troops when they entered into Russia. They would engage them and then retreat. And when they retreated, they would burn everything in their retreat, luring the French further and further into Russia, but burning any supplies they would be able to use, right? So the thing about it is in Napoleonic tactics, when you take over land and area, you're supposed to take whatever provisions you can find, food, goods, water, like things like that, clothing, and you take that from the locals wherever you are. Like if you're invading Prussia, but you're not for like, if you're a Napoleonic army from France and you're invading Prussia and you take over like Nuremberg, once you take over Nuremberg, you go into the homes of the local people, you take their goods and stuff like that, you keep marching forward, you use that to survive, right? But the Russians are making it so you can't have anything to survive. They're burning all of the supplies as they retreat, right? They even got all the way to Moscow and rather than see their most historic and large city in Russia, that of Moscow, formerly known as Muscovy, the seat of Tsar Ivan IV, Ivan the Terrible's government, rather than see that fall into the hands of Napoleonic forces, they burnt down 
Moscow, right? They burnt down Moscow. The Russians literally burned their own city. And they said, we will not allow this to fall into your hands. And after never receiving a surrender from the Russian Tsar, Napoleon start, tries to start retreating. But when he starts trying to retreat, it's over thousands of miles. He's got to go over a thousand miles and retreat. And here comes the Russian winter, right? He's trying to retreat and then sets in the Russian winter. The Russians are geniuses. They pulled Napoleon in on purpose. The buttons on their jackets are dissolving because they're made out of tin, right? The cans that they had actually put food in are dissolving as well. And literally over, oh my God, 590,000 of his 600,000 men starved or froze to death in their retreat. Look at the percentage number right there. Never has there been an army that has endured that many casualties following a war in any of the Napoleonic Wars on either side. And it was Napoleon's army that had almost 90% of it perish. That is insane, right? Starving or freezing to death which on top of it. So what's going to happen when Napoleon returns back to France? Even the people of France are like, bro, what the heck, right? And they decide, dude, you got to go, right? So what ends up going down is he tries to re reassemble another army, but the war of the Sixth Coalition occurs. They invade France, and France delivers Napoleon over to the coalition forces, including Britain, Russia, Prussia, and Austria. And for his warmongering, he is then going to be exiled. They decide not to execute him because they're like, we don't want to turn him into a martyr and for his like, people to actually show up. Because do you remember when we talked about like actually going back to uh, the Concordat of 1801, going back to like him crowning himself under the Pope? There was that thing that said 99% next to it. Because 99% of people in France voted for him to become emperor, right? But the big thing they don't want to do is turn him into a martyr. So for his warmongering, they decide to exile him to an island called Italy, or to an island called Elba off the coast of Italy, which... Dude, French Third or French Second Republic, what, or no, excuse me, yeah, French Second Republic, what are you doing here, bro? Like, why did you put him that close to the Italian coast? And also, look how close to Corsica he is. Why would you do that? Because he escapes, right? The big thing about it that ends up happening, he sits on Elba for about two years, and over two years, he figures out a way to escape and he escapes for 100 days. Napoleon escapes back to France, literally assembles an army again, and at the War of the Seventh Coalition, he loses at the Battle of... That battle, he loses at the Battle of Waterloo to the, co to the cohort of the Duke of Buckingham and coalition forces, and he is forced to exile a second time, right? He then gets exiled to the island of St. Helena, which is off the coast of Africa, and then he eventually dies in 1821 from stomach cancer, right? So the big thing about it is we'll kind of hash these things out a little bit. We'll go a little bit deeper into the different content as well. I just wanted to go ahead and get this flip out of the way, and I don't want to take any up, up any more of your three-day weekend. So we'll talk about that. If you want to learn a little bit more before class, there are some links down in the description that you can actually listen to and check out. But the big thing about it is we will talk about a lot of that stuff in class. I will see y'all then. Y'all have a good one.